lost in the middle of the southern Indian Ocean, almost equally distant from Africa, Australia and the South Pole, lie the three archipelagos of the French Southern Territories. As is the case with most polar waters, the vast expanses of sea that surround them are rich in nourishment. Difficult to get to as they are, and often lashed by storms, these volcanic islands are the kingdom of seabirds. The minute Crozzi archipelago numbers 36 species of them with a density of more than 60 metric tons per square kilometer, more than anywhere else in the world. This remarkable natural laboratory is also visited by French biologists who have been following the evolution of these bird populations for the past 40 years. Their studies have demonstrated that all of the pelagic species reproduce very slowly. They are, for that reason, adversely affected by certain industrial fishing methods. The albatross, the sooty albatross for instance, has seen its numbers cut in half in 20 years. But this is not a simple matter. The unbalances that man occasions can favour certain species at the expense of others. The king penguin population, for example, is increasing everywhere. This colony has thus gone from 10,000 to 120,000 individuals in 30 years. With more than 3 million, Crozet is home to half the world population. This demographic explosion is all the more intriguing due to the fact that the king penguin's reproduction cycle is the most unbelievable obstacle race. The natural element of seabirds is the sea, but they cannot reproduce there. King penguins therefore come back to land during the spring. They regain the beaches of their home island after a sea journey, during which they have stocked up on the necessary food reserves. Filled with fat, they then weigh between 12 and 15 kilograms for a height of around 90 centimeters. But they first need to find their partner among the thousands of lookalikes. Unable to identify each other on sight, pairs are formed thanks to their song. Bonds are formed during long face-to-face -face encounters. But for birds which can't fly, they nevertheless are rather flighty, as only one out of seven ever comes back to the same part of the following year. Acoustical studies have shown that these songs are marvellous sound-based identity cards. Each bird has its own unique and invariable song, with which it attracts the birds of the opposite sex. Speech may be silver, but silence is golden. Once the couple has come together, silence is of the essence. Woe to him who transgresses the law of silence. A third individual comes up and makes trouble. The creation of a trio ends up by breaking up the incipient couple. Everyone must begin all over again. The time has come to find one's own corner. The couple goes off looking for it, but careful. Since the same causes bring about the same effects, it remains forbidden to call out to the companion. The best thing to do is to follow along and adopt this curious waddling gait. Every phase of hormonal development is accompanied by corresponding rituals. When they are ready to mate, the partners indicate it through pecking with their beaks around their incubation pouches.
Seabirds reproduce in general every spring, as is the case with a giant petrel. On the other hand, many species of albatross, such as the sooty, reproduce only every other year. The courtship period of the wandering albatrosses is exceptionally long when compared to that of the king penguins. They sometimes need five consecutive seasons to establish their union definitively. They are slow to decide, but once they are united, it is for life. Capable of living for up to 50 years, they are champions of longevity and of fidelity. We are now in November, the beginning of the austral summer. The penguins have been back for around 20 days and the couples have now been created. They absolutely need to find a place of their own since the egg laying period will arrive soon. Both the male and the female possess a well irrigated incubation pouch. The one and only egg is brooded, touching the skin at a temperature of 39 degrees centigrade. The first birds to arrive take over the places located on flatter and surer ground. A second egg-laying period takes place towards the end of the summer, the latest arrival birds being four months behind the first. Such extension in laying dates is exceptional among the birds found in these harsh latitudes. Lacking a nest, the egg, once laid, is carefully placed on the penguin's feet. This ensures the insulation against the cold as well as against the ground's humidity, which is often soaking wet. The division of labour dictates that its mission once accomplished, the female leaves the egg in the care of the male, who takes the first turn at brooding. This shift will be the longest, lasting about three weeks. The female must gather her forces once again. Before leaving her mate, however, she makes sure of having memorized his song so that she can find him again. Weakened by having laid the egg, she leaves to replenish herself in the ocean. The occupation of the available space is dense but rigorously equitable. Each brooder controls a territory of approximately half a square meter. His location will not change during the course of the season. The limits of his territory are constantly defined by pecking and by the striking of flippers. Movements are rather narrowly limited on such a small piece of ground, and the least plank is immediately sanctioned. The incubators thus use up a great deal of their energy in conflicts with their neighbours. The brooding bird cannot abandon his throat in order to go and eat for the two months the incubation lasts. The partners, therefore, have to take turns, substituting for one another five or six times. Situated within the Roaring Forties, Crozet is one of the few islands that are swept by the many depressions that form and move through the sub-Antarctic zone. The result is a storm every third day, 300 rainy days a year. Floods are frequent, leading to the abandonment of the eggs. The belated penguins, which have not had the best choice of a nesting place, are the ones most particularly affected by these losses. After the floods, vast zones are abandoned in the periphery of the colony, thus further restricting the penguins' vital living space. The return of the female to take up a shift at hatching. This changing of the guard is the only time the two partners see each other. In such crowded conditions, these get-togethers are never very easy. In the general agitation, handing the egg over becomes a perilous undertaking. If by accident the parents let it roll off their feet, the worst is to be feared. 
Predators are quick to exploit any clumsiness on the part of the penguins. The sheet builds are in permanent surveillance all around the hatching territory, on the lookout for the least bit of food. The more powerful skewers have perceived the bustle. They dive into the crowd at the least sign of agitation. Although they are colonial, the penguins only defend their own territory. They have no common defense against aggressors, even though they are quarrelsome birds. The skewer devours its prey amidst generalized indifference. Yet the loss of an egg is irreparable. They will have to wait until the next year to try again. By this time, a third of the brooders have abandoned the attempt. The hatching of the eggs begins during the summer and goes on until winter approaches. The cheek is a precocious singer. It begins vocalizing when it is still in its shell. As a matter of fact, adult and chick learn each other's respective cry even before the egg hatches. Drunk with food, the parents arrive at the coast. Their expenditure of energy becomes considerable. For the usual necessities, the upkeep of their own metabolism, the energy expenditure brought about by long ocean treks, and their deep underwater dives, they now have to add the feeding of the chick whose appetite grows quite rapidly. These new needs force the parents to make never-ending round trips. Unable to fly, unlike the orcs of the northern hemisphere, the penguins are extraordinary swimmers. Certain animals, fitted up with Argus beacons that have been tracked by satellites, have revealed that they could go swimming for more than 1,000 kilometers from the nearest coast. Records of 4,000 kilometers have been documented. Once they find themselves over the fishing banks, the penguins capture tons of minuscule fish that can only be found by diving to a depth of over 300 meters. Such stupefying numbers are matched by the million six hundred thousand metric tons of fish caught by Crozes king penguins in one year, equivalent to twice the French fishing fleet's catch. Despite the vast resources of the austral waters, the birds found there compete ferociously with each other. Every species has its own preferred type of prey, as well as a fishing domain or technique of its own. Shags remain close to the shore and do not die very deeply. Albatrosses exploit the same oceanic territories as king penguins, but they only fish on the surface. Argus beacons have told us much about this bird's incredible performances. The record is held by the wandering albatross with its wingspan of over three meters. It can look for prey at distances of more than 5,000 kilometers from its nest. For the first few weeks of growth, the chick demands permanent attention from one of the parents who must warm it and feed it. Its naked skin offers no protection against air currents. If it were not able to take constant refuge in the incubation pouch, it would die of cold and would be, moreover, exposed to predators.
The shift's accelerator now take place every week. The adults return with a stock of food whose digestion is physiologically retarded. Day and night they regurgitate it little by little for the chick's benefit. The chicks have by now developed a very solid appetite. Their growth is spectacular. Their weight hadn't doubled in one week. At a month and a half, they weigh 20 times their weight at birth. The little one is thermically emancipated from about the age of one month, at which time it begins to move about. This poses a problem for the parents, who are desperately trying to ensure the respect of their individual territory. Little by little, the adults leave the colony. In order to resist the cold, the chicks are gathered into creches while the two parents devote most of their time to food gathering trips. The winter is coming, and the chicks born during the second hatching wave are still completely dependent on the adults, but food is becoming scarce. Even though the chicks' movements are limited, the territorial boundaries fade away, and after a week's absence, it becomes difficult for an adult to find its little one again amongst the thousands of similar birds. But the birds manage to identify each other once again thanks to their song. Winter is now here, and fish is becoming difficult to find around the Kozi Islands. Some of the chicks undergo a total fast for a period of four months. The adults remain at sea and find nourishment only for themselves. During the entire winter, the lucky ones may receive one or two feedings a month and this they have to share, unwillingly, with the sheet bills that go right to the source. Those that were born first, having been fed copiously in summer, are going to seemingly melt down, their weight decreasing from 12 to 5 kilos. But the younger ones that were born just before winter have not had time to build up enough reserves. The ordeal is too much for them, and 98% are eliminated. The breeding grounds are left clean by the giant petrel, as either predator or carrying eater. Only a third of the hatched chicks see the ocean one day. When all the risks are taken into account, less than one egg out of five produces an adult. At the return of spring, the great majority of adults, those that have lost their egg or their chick, head back to the shore for the annual molting period. They face a month-long fast, since the loss of their feathers prevents them making any excursions to the sea for thermal reasons. This year, they will be the first to be ready to reproduce in good condition. On the other hand, the parents which are still feeding their chicks have to molt later. This process deferred, their next reproductive cycle will be doomed to failure. The chicks of the wandering albatross are, together with those of the king penguin, the only ones that can endure the Antarctic winter. But unlike the penguin chicks, they don't need to go through long fasting periods. Their parents can feed them throughout the year, even if the quantities of food they bring back are modest. They have two advantages in getting through the seasonal rigours, the larger range of prey off which they can feed, and the immensity of the territory which they can cover. Living as they do in a very windy zone, these marvellous sailors manage to consume little energy in flight, losing barely 1% of their weight for every 1,000 kilometres flown. 
that is not yet the case for these would-be princes of the clouds. They still need a little training before the great departure. Their very long fledgling period does not permit the adults to reproduce themselves again the following year. Fifteen long months have gone by. By now the great ocean beckons. The chicks exchange their youthful down for a dinner jacket style coat made of new feathers. A water tight suit that will permit them to stay in the ocean for a year until the next moat. They can expect to live for about 20 years, but will only begin to reproduce around the age of four or five. Although it tries to brood a chick every year, the king penguin manages to reproduce like the wandering albatross every other year. How can we explain that with such a long reproductive cycle and such a weak success rate, the king penguin population is expanding, whereas that of most oceanic bird species is decreasing? In fact, even in these islands located at the nether end of the world, the answer once again comes from the disturbances generated by man. The seal and whale hunters of the last century also decimated the king penguins, now a protected species. But the near disappearance of the cetaceans has made great quantities of plankton available, upon which the penguins' favorite prey feeds. This abundance of resources in the sea today permits the king penguin, little by little, after more than a century, and at the expense of the whales, to once again reattain at least the numbers of its original population. It's to the Arctic on Monday evening at 7 to examine one of nature's most powerful creators and destroyers, the glacier. <laughs> 